So hello everybody, I am in Salem, South Carolina. As you can see, it's nice and warm here. Um, I am going to be giving an icon carving class this week. And um, for the beginning of this session, there's an icon carving class and an icon painting class as well, given by someone else. Uh, I was asked to give the opening talk and I decided to do it on the, on the uh, let's say radical solution that making Christian and especially liturgical art offers to our culture. And so I hope you enjoy this. Just so you know, like I've told you before, I've started making patron only videos and so this month, the month of September, I'm going to make a patron-only video interpreting the story of Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, it is one of my favorite stories because it's so strange, but I think there's a lot of interesting stuff we can get in there. I will also uh, look down in the description of this video because I will put the date and the place where I will be speaking in Chicago very soon. I will also be speaking at St. Econ Seminary in Pennsylvania near Scranton, Pennsylvania in the month of November. So if you're interested in that, I will put the details in there down below as well. So enjoy the video and every guys, I will talk to you soon. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. I was asked to give a definition of an icon. And so an icon is a sacred image. So the word icon is complicated because the word icon just means image. And so it's not, it, we, it's a shorthand, right? When we use the word icon, what we mean is sacred image. So we don't, we don't say sacred, but that's what we're talking about. So that's what makes the icon particular. It's because it is an image which not only depicts uh, sacred things, holy people, but also is sacred in the sense that it participates in the life of the church. It participates in the life of the liturgy as well. And so it is another word we could use is something like liturgical image. That's another way that we could talk about it. And so because of, because of what it is, because it is a sacred image, it has certain characteristics which grew up in the church, in the tradition of the church, to help identify the images, to help differentiate them from secular images, and to help us understand what it is that's going on inside the image. And so in terms of the, the actual canons, you could say, in terms of what the church has decided it is required for something to be considered a sacred image, you need to have an image of a person, a holy person, and you need to have the name of the person which is, which is written on the image. And that is actually in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the, the basic strict minimum of what it takes to, for us to recognize that this, okay, so this image is something, it's the image of a saint, it's the image of Christ, it's the image of the mother of God, and it, we put the name there so that there's no mistake, we know who it is we're interacting with, and that image is there to help us participate in the liturgy, participate in, uh, participate in the sense to interact with the person that is being represented. Um, and I think that that, that's going to slowly kind of bring me to what it is that I mostly wanted to talk to you about. I'll, as I'm talking, I'll give a little bit of characteristics of mm -hmm. the icon, but what I mostly want to bring people to think about right now is, is the particular moment that we are in, in terms of culture, in terms of Western culture, uh, Christian, post-Christian culture. We're at a point in, in our history where we have, we're very cultural. Right? We have a lot of cultural events. You know, if you, if you, all the cities, they'll organize different cultural events. And what's interesting, if you pay attention to what we now call culture today, what is it? Like a, going to a concert, you know, going to the theater, watching a movie. Um, all of these things, what, what uh, describes them is that they are entertainment. That we have come to a point in our own story where we have reduced what we call culture 
to entertainment, to something which you sit passively and you look at, you, 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 you watch a movie or you listen to music and you, you passively encounter something. And what's interesting about the icon and what's, it's not the only thing that's interesting, but what's fascinating if you think about it in the context of our social moment right now is that it's actually a way into a more profound and authentic way to engage with what we call culture. That is, the images, if you think of how modern art developed, you know, from let's say, especially from the time of the Romantics up to today, we really have this idea, and you'll meet artists today, you know, find artists who's, what is, what do they want? What is their hope? They, that they hope that their art can be shown in a gallery and that they can maybe have a nice catalog published with their images in them and that people with a lot of money will collect their art, put them in their collections so that then when they get shown in museums, then they could have, you know, you know where the provenance is oh, in, this, in this famous collection. So we have a series of cultural artif culture artifacts. We have artists, galleries, museums, right? And all of these are there for you to go and look at art or buy art and collect it, okay? Now, this is where you can see the difference between the icon. But the icon is going to be, in this, in this particular example, a window into an ancient world which is now gone, uh, which has sadly, not completely gone, but I'd say it's slowly fading away. Uh, when you're making an icon, you are not making the icon to go into a gallery. There are a few artists, sadly, there are a few iconographers who wish that's how it was. But usually when we make an icon, why are we making the icon? Usually, usually, two, usually two reasons. I mean, very practical reasons. I mean, like practical reasons. Usually it's because you're practicing or because you've been commissioned. That, those are the two reasons why you make an icon. Like either you're trying to get better and make better icons, so you're, you're learning, you're, you're improving your, your, your craft, or someone asked you and said, I need an icon of St. Dimitri. I need an icon of Christ, of this feast, of this, and that's when you make an icon. I don't, I don't, I make a very few icons. Once in a while I'll make icons just like that, but most of the time if I make an icon, I'm making an icon for someone. Now, that's a huge it's a huge difference. It's a huge difference if you think about the artist in their studio who's expressing themselves and then want, hopes to show their work in a gallery and hopes that their work will become famous. I am creating something for someone's particular need. That is, it's like making a chair, right? Like I'm making something for someone. But it's bigger than that. The, the, very, the particular transaction is that someone writes me, calls me, talks to me and says, you know, my, my nephew is being baptized and I would like to offer an icon of this saint. Something like that. And so there's a story there. It's a human story. There's a human story of someone who has a need, a church that has a need, uh, someone who wants to celebrate something. And so I am engaging them in that story. But then at the bigger level, what I'm also doing is I'm participating in a communal act. I'm participating in a communal language. That is the language of the icon, as you'll see those who are painting, those who are carving, you'll see it's a very specific language. And it's specific for uh, spiritual reasons, for theological reasons, but there's also another reason why it's specific. It's specific because it is a communal language. Just like any, just like English, is it, just like the spoken languages are communal languages. That is, when I'm saying something to, to James, I want him to understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to communicate something. I want to engage with him. And when we make an icon, we are entering it into a community, into a church, into a whole history and a whole community of people that recognize these images. There are other traditional arts and other cultures that have that, of course. You know, you think of... Uh, you think of, uh, now I'm not good, like musical instrument making. Making musical instruments is a, is a great example of, of that, where you are making a musical instrument for someone, let's say very high quality, and so it has to be beautiful, it has to, you know, you really want it to be the best, but it also has to do what? It has to play music, and it has to sound right so that person can then play music with his band. 
And so that's the same thing. It's, it's very similar to when we make an icon. We are cre- we're making an object f- within a language, within a community, for a community. And we're also, we're, so we're participating in this whole, also this whole strand of history. We're connecting ourselves to a community, but to the past. All of this is a connected language. So now contrast that with the, the, the state of secular art where we are today. Now, they don't succeed in doing it, but usually a lot of the famous artists today, the way that they get attention is by shocking, by doing something that no one has seen before. You know, is it innovative? Like, is it innovation has somehow become a core value of culture for some reason? The idea that you should do something that no one has seen before. And why? So they're appealing to something very different, something very, very different. This desire to titillate, right? This desire to surprise, to shock, to, uh, to, uh, to provoke a disjunction in culture. And if you look at modern art, from, especially from the 20th century now, you look at the modern artists, their particular goal was to create constant disjunctions, to, to break what was there before. So the Cubists tried to break the classicists, and then you know the surrealists came and said, all these formalists, no, we're going to break that with this kind of broken, this exploded imagination. The Dada came in and they said, we're going to break the whole thing. We're going to smash the entire the entire system and and that's our that's the background of the way that we think about culture today you know if you if you watch a movie that gets great great reviews usually they'll say oh this is new this has some kind of there's something you've never seen before it's innovative and everything now there's nothing wrong with innovation right it's it's very it's very dangerous as i'm going down this road i'm thinking he's oh he's He's saying you can't innovate. No, I, there's no, nothing wrong with innovating. But the question is always, when you're making icons, you always have to think firstly that you want to integrate this image into a community. So it's not that there's something wrong with innovating. But the, the question is, why would you innovate? You have to have a reason. There has to be something which would make you change what you're doing. Because if I'm trying to communicate something to you, I'm trying to engage you, you know, if I'm trying to to find out how your day went, I'm not going to make up a new word. That would be stupid. Because, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with making up new words if there's a reason to. But <coughs> unless there's a reason to, what you want to do is you want to focus on the purpose, the purpose of what you're communicating, the purpose of what you're doing. And that's what you find in, in iconography. So once you realize that, there's actually something, there's a, there's a strange little moment now also in culture is that we, we've kind of, you know, I said that most of our culture is, um, let's say it's entertainment and passive, but there's actually quite a lot of the passive culture, which is trying to be transformed into active participation. So there's some, I'll give you an example. This is, this is the, the most, the, the, one of the funniest examples. There's something in the United States, it's a pretty large organization, it's called Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. And what it is, it's basically a church. The people will meet every week um, and they'll have readings, group readings of Harry Potter books. So they'll sit together <coughs> and then they'll have a group reading of a Harry Potter book uh, and then they'll have a discussion about it. I don't know. I've never been to an, one of those events. I can kind of just kind of. What's that? Is this really real? This is yes. really real. You can look it up. Sacred, Harry Potter and the Sacred oh Text. Okay, but it's it's only one example of several other things like that. Like you have something called. You probably have heard of cosplay, where people will dress up as their favorite comic book movie characters, and then they'll go to these events, and they'll. They'll be costume and they'll like celebrate their fi- their fi- their favorite uh, fiction characters together in these 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 almost liturgical events. Okay, now but what you're seeing what you're seeing is we're seeing the end. We're seeing the the end of the passive entertainment culture. We're not that totally the end, but we're seeing it start to fray in these types of movements where people it's as if they're they're lacking something. They want participative culture because that's what ancient culture used to be like think about you know a village 200 years ago 300 years ago what was culture culture was 
you know, the Mardi Gras and uh, Lent, and then we had the feast of this saint and the feast of that saint, and then we would have processions and we had folk dancing. All of these were participative. There was, we didn't have this idea that culture was just sitting there and watching someone else perform something. Not that it was excluded, but that that's not wasn't the core of culture. Yeah. Do you think that's why social media is, is so popular? Is because they feel like they're participating? Yeah. Now, social media is an interesting is a very interesting thing in terms of community. Is that it is social media is a parody of community, because what we've had in let's say the past hundred years, we've developed this idea of the celebrity. Right? The celebrity has replaced the saint. We, we, we're not, not idiots. It's, it's pretty obvious. We call them stars. Uh, you know, we call them icons. We use all the words uh, that, that we would use to describe saints. They've replaced them. And so, but it, it's, it's an invert, obviously an inverted form of, of sainthood where it's whoever can titillate or shock or surprise or, or attract that a kind of a carnal attention, you could say, is the one who wins the game. But so, but, but, now there is this desire to participate, but it's, it's in the image of that strange, uh, that strange inverted thing. So social media, if you think of Facebook the way it works, or Twitter, same thing, we have the sense that it's somehow a form of community, but it, it's not really. What it is, it's basically people who are showing themselves and then other people who can watch. Right? So it's, it's, it's mini, mini stars. So it's, it's, it's basically exposing yourself and voyeurism. So you can look at some, you can, you can go on someone's Facebook page, you'll never know, right? They'll never know that you're looking at them unless you write a comment. But it's like, so, so, so I'm going to show pictures of myself. Some people can look at them. And so it's like, it's a mini form of this, this stardom that we have, like a little mini form of it. And, it, and it's, it's a parody of, it's a parody of community. Now, I, I'm on social media. Like, I'm not, not saying you shouldn't be on social media. I'm on social media. It's useful and everything. But I think it's important to understand the moment in culture where we are. Um, and like I said, all these, these things like, um, let's say, the, these, these kind of cosplay worlds, all these things. And also video games are part of it too. Video games are part of trying to create participative places where... <clears throat> where you're not only receiving culture, but you're actually engaging within an actual narrative. But what's, what's interesting about what we're doing, and this is, the most, this is why iconography, liturgical art, is in a way the most radical thing that you can do right now. Because the question it's posing, or the challenge that it's posing to culture, it goes very, very deep goes right at the root of our entire culture of entertainment and of passive, uh, let's say, aesthetic experience. And so that's why you look at, you know, someone like Marek and myself, there's other iconographers in North America who were actually trained in contemporary art. We were all trained in contemporary art, trained to be gallery artists, all of this. And reaching, let's say, the end of that, it seemed like the only place to go that was the only place to go was this desire for a participative culture. And the, the, the icon offers that in every way. Now, when I talk about the icon, it's very care we have to be very careful not to, um, not to disassociate it from everything else. That is, the icon only has its full meaning, its full purpose when it's, it's part of the community, when it's part of communion in the largest sense, when it's part of the liturgical life of the church. And so it's not, you can't, it's very, we're used to thinking of these objects as paintings because that's how we think, that's, it, it, it's, it's hard to break that. If we make these paintings, we put them on the wall, like that, that's, it, there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's important to understand that this has, it's part of an entire, let's say, an entire work of art. I, I, I always say that, the, uh, the, the composer Wagner, in, uh, at the end of the 19th century, he had a, a, a term. I'm probably not going to be able to say it. He had, a, he had a term which meant the perfect work of art. And he said, this is opera, because opera has all the different arts in, in it. It has visual art in terms of the scenery and in terms of composition. It has music in it. 
And so and it also has narrative, it has drama. And so he said, this is the perfect, it's the perfect work of art. It's the complete work of art. But there was one thing missing, right? What was missing? That was participation. Right? That's what was missing in Wagner's uh, is it Kassamt? I'm going to not be able to say it. Then it was the, per- the perfect work of art. And the, the perfect work of art is more something like the liturgical year. That is the perfect work of art. Because for, it covers the entire narrative, first of all, that we participate in, the narrative of Christ's life that we, that we engage in, that we try to emulate and participate in. It also includes all those things that Wagner talked about, which is we have the music, we have the visual aspect, we have, the, like I said, we have the narrative, but we also have architecture, which Wagner didn't have. We also have the actual space itself is, is thought out. And that's why, that's why the, the Orthodox tradition has done us such a service by preserving the basic grammar of the Christian language, it has, it has offered us the possibility to once again participate in this full language. You know, it's hard to do in our modern world, but we're, all, we're also, also alienated, even though we're Orthodox, we're not, we're not like in a Greek village you know, 500 years ago, but we do have this door that is open to us. Um, and the, like I said, the fact that we always have to remember that the icons are not just painted boards. They are images inside the church. The placement of the icons in the church is coherent. It's not arbitrary. You put certain image. It's not always the same. It's not 100%. uh, It's not a system. But it is always theologically proposed. That is, images. the images speak to themselves within the church. The images also speak to themselves across different icon types. And that's something that we always have to remember. Just like the, the person who's excited to read you know, Marvel Comics and to see references to other Marvel Comics in their Marvel Comics and to see how all of these you know, go to watch an Avengers movie and to see all the different superheroes that they like come together into an, an Avengers movie, like look at the icon of The Last Judgment. Right? That's the ultimate Avengers movie. <laughs> you have every single story from Adam and Eve Right, all the way to the last, to, to the final moment of the whole universe, all put into one image. In the icon of the last judgment, we have the ascension. We have the uh, we have the the, the basic deuses. We have all these different images that are that are kind of brought into one, and then all the other icons also talk to each other. So there's this inter is a fancy word, but this intertextuality that we that exists within the icons. But the icons are not just talking to themselves; they're also referencing the liturgy, they're referencing scripture, and so all of this is like this massive grammar, this massive sacred grammar of things that are talking to themselves, and we are part of that that massive poetic language, and that's why the the, the actual architecture of the church is also important. Because, let's say just in terms of iconography, that there are different ways you can make a church, but let's say the basic Orthodox church with a dome and a, and a square. Well, there's a reason why Christ is up in the dome and that you have a hierarchy of angels or that you have the saints who are watching Christ ascend. All of these things are related to what the dome is. The dome is the dome of what happens in the West in the church. It'll be relevant. It'll be the dormition of the Mother of God. It could be the Last Judgment, something which represents the end, the sun that sets. If you look at the East, then you see the child Christ who is coming out of the Mother of God's womb. So you have the dawn, you have the, 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 the dawn and the sun rising out of the East and the sunset in the West. So the whole church is, is a cosmic image. And all these icons are speaking to themselves. The hymns, all of that goes together. And so that is what I'm trying to propose to people, is that what I'm finding now is that for a lot of the young people, like the people in their 20s, at least the ones that I'm in contact with, that is a very, very attractive thing because they've reached the end of, you know, they've reached the end of their world like they they've played 
hundreds and hundreds of hours of video games, and they're they're tired, right? They they they're they're tired of that empty desire that desire to participate, which always leaves you somewhat empty, and they 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 love all these all these mangas and all these comic books and all this kind of pop culture, but they also realize that there's something missing, and to be able to propose this view and it's you. Like I, I've given you some images, some 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 hints of what's going on in this, say this gigantic grammar, this gigantic story that we have in the Christian tradition. But it's inexhaustible. It is inexhaustible because it starts at Genesis and it ends today, to, ends into the end of the world. But like we're part of it too, and all these saints are part of it too. And the whole movement of history is part of it too. So you have this. You can participate. You can be inside a story, and that has. That has so much value for people today. Anyways, I that what I've seen is young people who are thirsty to have something to participate in. And so when we paint the icons, we need to understand that the the codes, let's say that the, the the norms of the icons are not arbitrary. They are there first of all to make that image the most participative it can be to make the image of the saint bring you into communion with that saint in the in the best way right there's been a lot of discussion about style some of you will be aware of this some of you will not be aware of it but within the world of iconographers there's been a massive debate over style for like the last 50 years maybe and uh and it's still raging today it's still raging today uh but when you when you look at the image as this desire to commune, to commune with the tradition, to commune with the people, to commune with the, the, the church, then a lot of those problems are less urgent because the, the, the decisions that you make are not only stylistic, they're also there, like I said, so that people will <coughs> understand what it is that you're trying to do. Um, so I'm not going to solve the stylistic problem for you today. But uh, <laughs> in terms of understanding why there's a halo, understanding why the saints uh, are, are looking at you usually either straight on or three quarters, all of this is, is, is part of this, right? We don't show an icon of a saint with the back of their head. Why? Because, <clears throat> because of what I said. The image is there for you to engage with it. It's not there for you to just, to just uh, look at how nicely well done the, the painting was done and there's nothing wrong with that too there's nothing wrong with a beautifully painted icon but that's not the that's not the first reason why it exists in the world so anyways i'm not going to speak forever i just was hoping to give you that little little uh thought and uh to maybe under to help us realize that as we're sitting there at our table and we're trying to figure out how to paint the face or paint, you know this you know just the actual technical part that we're also even if subtly working towards a world where there's a renewal of participative culture a renewal of the capacity to enter into a story and it's the best story right it's the best story because it's the story of Christ it's the best story so thank you So I don't know if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Um, it just occurred to me, you know, what you've been saying is, is great to, to hear because I haven't been able to articulate this and put it all together. It's, it's great. Go a step further, if, 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 I'm, if, I'm in, if I'm in order. We come, to, we come into church, we come to the icon, we venerate the icon, we kiss the icon. We are maybe without realizing it, engaging ourselves into this realm of the icon. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to say about the way we do it or the meaning that we do it or what you... Yeah. Well I think <clears throat> I think that when we when we reverence an icon, when we venerate an icon, we have to at least that's the way I understand it. The way I understand it is it's the same way as when in church, the priest will come out and he'll bow before us. We bow before the priest. You know, we, 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 we are, that is the way we engage with ourselves. And so when you encounter an icon, 
it's not just an image, right? It's an image of a person. It's an image of a story. It's an image of an event in the life of Christ or in the life of a saint that is extremely meaningful to us. And so by, by venerating it, we're doing this, like I said, we're doing the same thing. We're recognizing how God is manifesting himself through that. Right? When you bow down before someone, it's like you're, bow, you're not just, if I bow down before in church, if, I, if, if the deacon is, is sensing and, and I bow before the priest, like I'm not bowing before, you know, Bob. I mean, yes, but it's not, that's not the point. The point is that, I, is that I'm bowing before the image of Christ, which is, which is appearing through him as we are in this, this space of communion. And so the icon is also the same. It's like when we look at the image, obviously we're looking past the actual paint. We're seeing the saint, and we're, we're, we're ultimately we're actually looking past the saint to a certain degree where we're seeing Christ in that saint. Right? Where everything leads to Christ. The whole, all of, commun- all of the liturgy, everything, all the icons, all of this, all leads to the image of Christ, which is appearing in its different as sparks in the different people around us and the different mm-hmm. events around us. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Do you have a question, Elise? <laughs> Can you speak to the experience of the artist participating in icon painting or icon carving? What's going on or what could be going on spiritually within that participation process? Um, I mean, I think that I think that first of all, there's a there's like an objective aspect. I think that just like in church, there's a sacramentality, which is not dependent on the individual of you know the individual's particular moment right now. It's like the sacraments are valid, no matter what the priest, even the priest, the jerk or whatever. Like it, it, the sacraments are valid, and I think that in a certain manner that goes the same for an icon. We have to be careful. We have to be careful about that because you will hear people say things like, because, you know, this icon was painted by this guy who's, you know, he's not in the church or barely in the church or, you know, whatever. That's dangerous because the image with the name, if that image is part of the, let's say, part of the language of the church, you know, it can participate in the life of the church. And so that's important. That's important to understand. Now, on top of that, Let's say on top of that, there is then the more mystical aspect, which is there also in in the sacramentality of the church. You can go to church and then you can have this amazing moment, right? This amazing grace where you're transported, where you 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 can feel the grace of God, you know, kind of just being funneled down into you. And I think it's the same for when we encounter an icon, and I think it's the same for when you're making an icon. So there are moments when I've been making icons where I was like not there at all, where I was completely and I was fighting with my wife or, you know, I have financial problems and this is what's going on. And, you know, I finish the icon and someone loves it, says it's beautiful, and it's full of grace or whatever. And it's like, that wasn't me. That wasn't me for sure. Like I didn't, that, that was beyond me. But there are other moments when you are carving or paint I'm not I don't paint but let's say you're carving the an icon and then you really have these first of all you can have these very strange moments in terms of encountering the saint that you are painting or that you're carving that has happened to me oh very oddly where I'm making an image of a saint and then all of a sudden all these strange events you know regarding this saint start to appear and all of a sudden the saint is everywhere for some reason you know, it's like I hear people talking about that saint or you see uh I mean, all kinds of different, you know, you go to, a, you go somewhere and then there's some strange uh, story of that the saint has been here or something like that. So that is something that can definitely happen to you and uh, has happened to me several times. Um, and then also, I think that in the best moments, I think that making uh, an icon can also be a prayerful act because you are, you are, it's a, you're participating in the life of the church as you're making the image. You know, you, you are. You're making something for the church. If you're doing it in a spirit of, of service and humility, uh, you know, and you're connected to, to the saints, then I think that you can also have just these moments of, of grace, you know, these moments of peace, these moments of... Uh, um, so, yeah. I'm sure it can go pretty far. I'm sure if we were saints, we might have visions of the saint, and I'm sure it could go a lot further than that. Sadly, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs>
Does anybody have questions for those who have come maybe for the first time? Do you have questions on why icons look the way they do? You'll, Anna will will be also giving people. I'll be talking about it in our in our class as well, and kind of talking about different different just the some of the more like the codes you could say like there are certain things in icons which you need which we which we traditionally put in icons for us to to engage with them properly and to recognize them so all right well thank you for your attention thank you very much and i wish everybody a great week and uh it's uh it, I, it's it's tough you know it gets it gets hard especially after a few days and so uh we'll we'll hopefully you can all in the morning go have morning prayers and put ourselves in the right track for the day. So, If you enjoy the Symbolic World content, there's a lot of things you can do to help us out. If you're not subscribed, please do. Uh, go ahead and share this to all your friends if you can. Get involved in the discussion. We have a Facebook group in which people can talk about these subjects. I will put all those links in the description. And also, if you can, please support us financially by going to my website, www.thesymbolicworld.com slash support. And I also have a Patreon and a subscribe star. So thanks again, and I will see you soon.